Good morning, everyone. Welcome in uh, to our worship service here. Thank you for joining us here at CCDC this morning. It's wonderful to see you all here. Um, let's all bow our heads together in prayer uh, as we begin our worship service. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the joy and the privilege of once again being able to gather um, as a community to worship you, to give you honor and praise, and to learn from your word this morning. We thank you for this um, fellowship that we have through Jesus. We thank you for the gift of salvation that you've given to us, to all those who place their, their love and their faith in Jesus. And we pray that this morning you would help us to grow closer to him, to love him more, and to walk with him uh, continually in our lives. Um, we thank you, and we just want to sing these songs um, praising your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all rise together. <clears throat> What our Savior has done, see how his love overcomes, he has done great things, he has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave You free every captive and break every chain Oh, God, you have done great things we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things, oh God. You have done great things. is my reward. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. The 
Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will see no turning back. I've been set free.
Lord Jesus, come lead us. We're desperate for your time. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh again, and come search our hearts and purify our lives. your perfect love, we need your discipline, and we're lost unless you guide us with your love. Lord Jesus, come lead us, we're desperate for your touch. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We cry out for your life to refine us. Cry out for your love to define us. Cry out for your mercy to keep us blameless until you return. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come that you. you would reign in us, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We dedicate ourselves to you and this time to you as we turn our attention to you now in your word. We ask, Lord, that you would reign here in this place, that you sitting on the throne of heaven Your son, Jesus Christ, who is the rightful owner of the throne of this world. We dedicate ourselves to you and to your glory and to your majesty. And we sacrifice ourselves to you now in your honor and in your glory. And we pray that you would receive it from us. We pray that uh, as we, day after day, week after week, express our devotion and our loyalty to you in this place, as we worship you in this place, that your name, your great name, would be proclaimed from this place into the world that needs to know who you are. Be honored and glorified this morning as we look to your word. We pray that you would speak to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Before you sit down, actually, let's do this now. Let's take a moment to greet those around you. The children can be dismissed. Let me take a moment to welcome here to, you here to Contra Costa Gospel Church to our English worship service. This morning we're going to deviate a little bit from our normal sermon series in Deuteronomy, just for today. 
And I want to talk about something that uh, is a little bit different, a little bit off the beaten path. I want to talk this morning about this concept of sacrifice, of sacrifice, of what a lot of us do for things that we care about. Um, I know that all of us are familiar with this concept, this idea of sacrifice. You sacrifice something. You sacrifice your time or your energy for your job, for your work. You do. You go every day and you give of yourselves to your work and to your profession. And in so doing, you sacrifice. Some of you, many of you actually, work odd hours. You work on the weekends. You work at night. You work the overnight shift. We have a lot of healthcare workers in our church of various kinds of, uh, in the healthcare industry, just we're so close to John Muir and Kaiser. You understand sacrifice. You sacrifice time from, away from your family. You sacrifice your own body and your energy. We understand sacrifice when it comes to our families. We sacrifice for those in our family. We understand sacrifice when it comes to our education. You, you, you have to sacrifice. You sacrifice time to go and play so that you can study and prepare and do whatever you need to do to get ready for that test. You sacrifice for your financial future. If you're working and you have a 401k or an IRA or something along those lines, you set aside money. You take some money that you could spend today and have a great time, have a great vacation, buy a new car, and you put it away, you sacrifice it for the time being for your financial retirement future. When you are committed to anything, you understand that to pursue that thing, to build for that thing is going to cost you something. I remember when I first got my very first job, I was making very, very little money. It was an entry-level job at a pharmaceutical company. And my boss at that time, who was probably 15 years older than me, I was just out of college, and he was probably in his late 30s, and he said, Eddie, I'm going to give you some advice. And he knew I was very fresh, very green to the working world. First time I got a real paycheck out of college. And he said, I'm going to give you some advice. He said, number one, our company offers a stock program. Maximize that. Okay? 5% is the maximum you need, to, you need to elect to contribute 5%. This is good for you. And he says, for your 401k or whatever it was, I guess it was a 401k, he said, you need to maximize that too. These are good, good things for you. And I looked at my paycheck and I maximized the 401k and I maximized the stock. I had nothing left. How, do I, how am I going to live off of this? I, I pay rent. I pay for my car, my insurance. I got no money to take Cindy out. What, what am I, he said, this is good for you. And he told me that this is going to be good for you to do this. Well, fast forward. Three years later, Cindy and I are now engaged. And we need to pay for the wedding. And I looked at all this stock that I had accumulated from my company. It wasn't a whole lot. But it paid for the wedding. And I thought, wow, had he not told me to do that three years prior, we would have a wedding at the park, okay? Which is fine, but like with other people there, and you know, let's just set up right here. You know, thankfully we were able to have uh, a wedding when inviting a lot of people, largely because of this guy's recommendation for me to sacrifice we don't have to talk very much about what it means for you all to sacrifice. You understand, particularly those of us, and there's not maybe not a whole lot in this congregation, but I, I'm speaking the same message in the next service. And in that service, I'm going to talk about the sacrifice that immigrants make. I'm not an immigrant. But now in my 40s, I understand so much better the sacrifice my mother and father made to come to this country. And if I could, thank you. Thank you for doing that. My sister is here this morning. My brother and I, my sister, we appreciate the sacrifice that they made 
to come to this country. And it was a sacrifice. They left their home country. Hey, um, guys, right now, I want you to move to Zimbabwe forever and never come back and live there and build your life there. Zimbabwe is easy. They speak English and stuff. We need to pick a country where they don't speak English. A country where you have to learn the language. Think about the sacrifice that it takes to do that. I've thought about this a lot and realized that because they valued, they valued a better life. They valued the prospect of raising a family in a place where there was more opportunity. And on and on and on. At that time, in the 60s, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity in their home country. And they could come to the United States of America and find that life that they were looking for. And so they made the sacrifice. It's because they valued this ultimate goal that they were willing to make the sacrifice. So much so that I would say to you this morning, I can tell what you value based on how much you are willing to sacrifice for that. Whatever that is. If you value this thing, you're going to sacrifice a lot of yourself. You're going to give a lot of yourself. You're going to give your time. Maybe it's to give your money. It's to give your energy for this thing, whatever it is. And if you're not willing to sacrifice for this thing, you probably don't value it very much. Hence the title, how much says how much. How much you give of yourself and you sacrifice of yourself will tell me how much you value that thing. I want to turn our attention this morning to the book of Malachi who talks about the same concept with regards to the Lord. What we sacrifice for God. How much we sacrifice for God. And how much you sacrifice for the Lord is an indicator of how much you value the Lord. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Malachi, chapter 1. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. The easiest way to find the book of Malachi is to find the book of Matthew. Find Matthew chapter 1 and turn back one or two pages to Malachi chapter 1. And I want to read this morning from Malachi chapter 1 starting at verse 6 to verse 14. Malachi chapter 1. From verse 6 to verse 14. When you find, it's a little tiny book. So take your time. Go ahead and find it. When you do find it, go ahead and kind of look up so I know that we're all ready to go. Oh, thank you. Smile at me too. I really appreciate that. Even through the mask, I can see your eyes get all squinty. Then I know you're ready. Malachi chapter 1. Follow along with me as I read here. It says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you? Says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering 
For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. In this passage, Malachi lays out a situation. He's speaking on behalf of God, and God has some words for the priests of that day, of that time. You see, these priests were in charge of the sacrifices, the daily sacrifice, the animal sacrifice that would be burned for, for, uh, in obedience to the covenant to the Lord. God desired those sacrifices. Some of them were sin offering sacrifices. Some of them were fellowship sacrifices. Just, again, just in their worship of God, which involved this kind of sacrifice. The priests were in charge, and God has a problem with what the priests are doing. Because the priests who are supposed to be offering the good ones of the flock, they're not doing that. They're holding back the good ones. And they're offering instead the blind ones, the lame ones, the crippled ones, the diseased ones. You see, God says in the Old Testament that when you offer to me your gifts, offer to me what we call the first fruits, the first of your bounty. I'm giving you so much. Take the first of it and offer to me that because I am worthy of the best. I can attest to you. I've talked a lot about this fig tree that I have in my yard. I love this fig tree. I I look at this fig tree, I go out there all the time, and are the fruit ready? And I can tell you that every season I get, generally speaking, I get two crops of figs. I get one early in the season, and then there are some unripened ones. I'll pick all the ripe ones first, and then I'll come back in a month or six weeks or so, and I'll go and I'll get the second batch. And the first batch, oh boy, I tell you this, I could sell the first batch. (laughs) I kid you not, they're pretty. They're uniform in color. They're just the right texture. They're like soft but not mushy. And they're delicious. If you enjoy figs, come to my house. We'll, we will feast together on my fig tree. Okay? If you don't like figs, or maybe you're not as close to me, come for the second batch. No, just kidding. <laughs> the second batch is not as good. It's just not as good. It's not, it's not as sweet. Uh, I'm just kidding. I will eat the second. You can have the first. Okay. Uh, Sacrifice. (laughs) Um, The second batch just isn't as good. And God says, offer to me the good ones. When you offer to me your animals, it needs to be an unblemished one. It needs to be one that is spotless. You hear this a lot of the lambs. They have to be spotless. Why does God care that there are no spots on this sheep, on this lamb? God is trying to train these people for them to understand that he is worth the best. But they're not doing that. They're given not even the second best. They're given the the diseased ones, the ones that they're going to throw away anyway, the ones that aren't going to make it. Oh, this one's going to die? Let's give it to God. He won't know the difference. And then it says in verse 14, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it. So in other words, a guy who says, oh, I have all these and I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, Lord, I'm going to give you this one. And then at the very last moment, when I actually bring the animal, I bring this, this one, the runt. Oh, Lord, here you go. You get my best one. Make a big show of it. You get this one, Lord. And then bait and switch, I'm going to give you. The one that I was gonna, the ones that's not gonna make it past the end of the week. Cursed be the cheat who has a male and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord that which is blemished. 
This is the problem that we see. And when we do this, and when they do this, they are saying of God here, look at this last line, they are saying that the Lord's table may be despised. They are saying that the Lord's table is not worth the best. That's what they are saying. When they communicate, or what they communicate by giving these blemished animals is that, God, you're not worth that much. You're not worth the best. The best one we can sell. I can sell my figs, the first ones. The second ones, no one's going to buy them. I can't sell those. Why would I donate? Why would I sacrifice the best ones? But in doing so, you are saying to God that you are not worth it. You are not worth it, God. You're not worth the best. In our family, a meal that is kind of a regular occurrence, maybe once, uh, a few, once every few weeks, maybe once a month. And the family tends to like this meal. I'm going to show you a picture, okay? Does this look familiar? These are, these are called water dumplings, boiled dumplings. I'm going to be honest with you. She's not here, and she already knows this. I don't love these. But I also, I, I very much appreciate that she, she makes them by hand. She makes the stuff that goes in the middle, um, she buys the skins, okay? Let's, let, let's be honest here. This is, this is not a professional chef here. But, however, uh, everyone likes these. Okay, so when you make these, uh, I was taught by my sister, actually. You put the, the frozen dumplings in the water, the boiling water, and then when the bubbles come up, you pour a little bit of water, cold water. Have you learned this, this method, right? And then it'll start to bubble again. You pour some more cold water. You do that three times, that's the magic. This is the genius of Chinese people, okay? There's no clock. There's no timer. It's just three times of water, okay? I told that to somebody once, and they lit up, and they said, you guys do that too? It's as if it was just common knowledge back in the day in the old country. Well, inevitably, when you cook these, from time to time, what happens to the ones that are in the water? Sometimes you overcook them. Sometimes when you're making them, you didn't really squeeze tight enough. So as a result, when you make them, what happens to them? What happens to them when you boil them and you didn't squeeze quite tight enough or you overcook them? They break, right? And so she'll fish them out of the water and she'll have two plates, one of uh, the whole ones and one of the broken bits. And then she proceeds to put the broken bits in front of the kids so that we can enjoy the good ones. Right? That's what she does, right? No. She doesn't do that. She gives the good ones to the kids. And we eat the broken ones. And they're, all, they're hard to grab with your chopsticks because they're slimy and you know, they're all like little, little, little bits and pieces. They don't quite chew as the same way. There's a chew to it. There's a mouth feel to it. We don't get to experience that when there are broken ones because we eat the broken ones. And in so doing, she is just naturally for the sake of the family, or maybe she'll do it, she'll put it in front of herself. She will eat the broken ones. Such a simple thing, and yet such a vivid illustration to me of because she values the rest of us, or in this particular case, we value our children, or, hey, come over to our house for dumpling night. Let's see if she gives you the broken ones, okay? Then you'll know how much she values you. <laughs> if you see broken ones on your plate, oh, sorry about that. I'll give you the good figs, okay, I promise. Because we value the people at our table, we give you the good ones and we take the broken ones. And the priests were doing the exact opposite. They were holding back the good ones for themselves and they were giving God the broken ones. They were giving God the messed up ones. This is the idea that Malachi is talking about here. Brothers and sisters, it's a really simple applicational point. Are you giving God the broken ones? 
I mean, we can just stop right here and make a whole point of this. What are you sacrificing to God? Are you giving him the good ones, the first fruits of your time, your money, your energy, whatever it is, your resources, your talents? Are you giving him the good ones or are you giving him the broken ones? It's very simple. It's a very simple concept to understand. It's a very difficult concept to be retro, introspective about. Because we have to ask ourselves, what are we giving to God? Are we giving him of our first fruits? How much you sacrifice for the Lord's sake, for your relationship with him, to his worship, to his service, how much you sacrifice shows how much he means to you. And so we go on to the next point is, what should he mean to us? What should he mean? What does Malachi say in these passages, in these verses? What does God say of himself? That he, what kind of position should he take in your life? We look here. A couple of verses. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great. Or maybe in this particular case, he's saying, my name should be the greatest to you, O priests. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name should be great. It should be. It needs to be, and it will be one day. You know, the uh, Philippians says, one day every knee will bow and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. I can just imagine that day. There are people out in the world who don't believe in Jesus, and they will be compelled one day to finally recognize, uh-oh, we made a huge mistake. We've been rejecting Jesus our entire lives. <gasps> he is the king of kings. And they're going to bow in fear. God says, my name will be great among the nations. Verse 14, cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished, for I am great, says the Lord. My name will be feared among the nations. Four or five times in this passage, God reminds the people, my name is great. My name will be great. It needs to be great. And you don't communicate that with what you give. You, you make my name so-so. And how does he refer to himself in this passage? Very quickly here, verse 6, you see here, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 8 says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10, says the Lord of hosts. I have no pleasure in you at the bottom. Says the Lord of hosts. Verse 11, for my name will be great. Says the Lord of hosts. Verse 13, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 14, I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, eight or nine times. That's how he refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. What does that even mean? If you're reading the NIV, it doesn't translate it as the Lord of hosts. It translates it as Lord Almighty, which is fine. And I, I, Okay, it's not really what it says, though. It literally says he is the Lord of hosts. And this word hosts means thousands and thousands of something. He is the Lord over thousands and thousands. Thousands and thousands of what? What's well, a military term? It's thousands and thousands of soldiers. He is the Lord of armies. He is the Lord. He is the general, the supreme leader of a whole army of soldiers. And it's not so much that he's the army of soldiers. Are these angelic soldiers, people soldiers? It doesn't matter. It's that he stands at the pinnacle, the point of this pyramid. Below him are thousands and thousands who all pay attention to him and who all move and breathe and function 
when he says, do it, go, now. They all follow his orders. He stands at the top. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, in the the Taiwan army in the 40s, was a general. He's passed away now. He's been almost dead 40 years. He was a general in the army. Now, when I knew him, he was not a general. He was just my very wonderful grandfather. But from what I understand, he was quite an imposing figure. In fact, I've seen this photo. I don't know if you've seen it. It's at uh, our aunt's house. He's standing at 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 a podium this. And the the picture is kind of from this angle. He's standing at a podium and there are a hundred thousand soldiers at attention. It's impressive. It's impressive. And he is giving a speech, whatever it is, I don't know what what the situation was, but he's commanding this many people. The Lord says of himself, I am the Lord of armies. I am worth the best. I am worth whatever you have. I am worth your first fruits. Because of who I am, my name is great. And I am the Lord over tens of thousands. There's no one that stands above me. How much you give to the Lord says how much you value Him. We are, we are supposed to value Him as the highest, the greatest, the, uh, the, most, the one with the most fame and glory because that's who He is. And just to round this out this morning, I want to just close with this thought that we have to understand something. That the living the Christian life to one degree or another, is going to call you to make a sacrifice. Living the Christian life is going to require that you make some kind of sacrifice. And I want to be very clear. This is, I'm not necessarily talking about money. Um, maybe if you don't know me that well, you might think, oh, this is, he's just fishing for, no, this is not about money. This is more about priority and choice. If you make the choice to follow after the Lord and you come to understand who He is, the more, the, the more your eyes are open, your spiritual eyes are open to see who He is, the more you realize there is no amount of whatever resource you have. There is no amount that is too much for Him. There's no amount. There's no amount of your time that, oh, you know what, that's too much for Him. There is no amount. We have to understand that when you come and live for the Lord and you pursue your faith in Him, it's going to call you to make a choice. And it may even require you to make sacrifices. And your sacrifices are not necessarily my sacrifices. They're different. If you follow the Lord, it may actually cause you to sacrifice family relationships. You may have to. It's a tough one, but I have to bring this up here. Matthew chapter 10. This is Jesus' words, okay? He says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. You ever wonder what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? Um, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, says the Prince of Peace. Jesus, you you didn't come to bring peace? He says, no. This is Matthew chapter 10, and in this chapter, he sends his disciples, his 12 disciples, out as missionaries, two by two, they go in pairs, and they go and tell the nation of Israel that the Messiah has arrived. And there are going to be some in this missionary journey, this missionary excursion to Israel. There are going to be some that are actually going to believe in the Messiah, but the majority of them will not. 
And Jesus says, listen to me, brothers and sisters of Israel. If you choose to follow me because you've come to recognize that I'm the Messiah, your family will reject you. This is more true in a Jewish family than maybe any other family. They don't just think of Jesus neutrally. Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. Oh, that's, he's, he's a very important person. No, they hate Jesus. He is a source of mockery. He's a joke. And so he says to the Jews, if you follow after me, it's good. I'm just going to prepare you that you're going to be rejected. And, and by following me, in a sense, you are rejecting your own heritage. Because your heritage does not follow after me. Sometimes we, have, we encounter uh, individuals who will tell a story. They'll tell their, their own personal testimony of coming to faith in Christ. That when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, their family rejected them. Because their family, uh, they, uh, perhaps they were devout Buddhists or they were devout something else. How could you follow after this? And Jesus says, look, it's not like I like the fact that you are being rejected by your families, but it is true that this may happen. Now, this may not be your burden. It's certainly not my burden. But it is the burden of some. One of my best friends became a Christian in college, but for years for years was prohibited by his family to get baptized. You see, he was raised as a Catholic, and he was baptized as an infant. And his parents, who were devout Catholics, refused to allow him to be baptized as an adult in what we would call a believer's baptism. We here at Contra Costa Gospel Church practice what's called a believer's baptism. You've got to believe to be in the water. Obviously, infants don't believe yet. So they're not, we're not baptizing babies. His parents refused. Went through college for four years. We all knew that this was his burden, that his parents refused. He wanted to get baptized. His parents refused. Go into graduate school. He's now in graduate school. And finally, after three or four years of graduate school, I get the email from him. Hey guys, there's a group email. I just want to share with you that I'm getting baptized. And it's going to be on such and such a date. And I would love it if you guys could come. Can I just tell you, we all flocked to that church. It was an hour and a half away. That's okay, because my buddy's getting baptized. I'm not sure what happened with his parents. Somehow he worked it out with them. And when he got baptized, we sang. We rejoiced. It was fantastic. I still remember it. He made a choice. And that choice perhaps required him to sacrifice a little bit of this acceptance from his parents. Because sometimes sacrifice will call you to make that choice. Sometimes, as Christians, if you choose to live the Christian life, you choose to live according to the word of God, the sacrifice is money. Now, here you go, but this is not what you're thinking. I'm not talking about offering. I'm talking about the sacrifice that you make. You make it when you choose to live honestly. Hey, we're in tax filing season, huh? And by the way, your tax donation receipts are going to be available. This is a very good segue for that announcement. <laughs> and you're going to file in your taxes how much you donated to CCGC and whatever other missionaries and, and ministries and charities that you give to. Does the government check? Maybe. I, I've filed taxes now for 25 years, maybe longer. I've never gotten checked, not once. I put, here's what I donate to such and such a charity. No one's checking. It's on your honor. One day they might check. They haven't yet. But when you choose to live according to the word of God, you sacrifice an opportunity to skim a little off the top. It is true. Psalm 73 says, this is the psalmist 
lamenting this very situation. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When you choose to live according to the word of God, you forego. Voluntarily, knowing full well that you could skim off the top and probably not get caught. And yet when you do so, we make that sacrifice all the time. I have a friend who used to work at a retail outlet where they sold printers and computers and whatnot. And he would tell me about this struggle that he experienced. Because when you're selling a printer, you're selling it on commission or whatever. You have a quota and you're getting a record of your sales and this and that. It's easy. You know, back in the day, this is, we're talking about inkjet printers. And the highest markup was on the inkjet cartridges themselves. And so you want to sell these things, right? So all you got to tell them is, hey, you know the inkjet cartridges in the, in the printer that you get? They're very, very low. You're going to need some cartridges pretty soon. You just kind of fib and, 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 and maybe overemphasize and a little, bit, uh, a little bit dishonest, perhaps. And as a result, you can sell more cartridges. And I remember at this time, this brother telling me, wow, it's, it's, it's like so easy. If I just played the game, I could make a little more, I could be a little higher on the chart, but if I'm honest with the actual product, I'm going to sell less. It's really simple. And when you choose to follow after the Lord, there is that sacrifice that we make of being honest. We sacrifice that opportunity. There's not really a verse for this next one, but all of us understand that when it comes to the service of God, the pursuit of God, the worship of God, you sacrifice your time. We know this one, brothers and sisters, we come here Sunday after Sunday sacrificing our time. When you serve the Lord, you sacrifice your time. There are people who come to church during the week. Maybe some of you, you come on Sundays and you serve on Sundays. There are people who come during the week to sacrifice their time to serve the Lord. And we see this time and time again. The worship of God, when you recognize how great God is, is going to ask of you things that uh, are going to cost you something. But His name will be great. His name will be high as he is the Lord of hosts. Sacrificing is tough because it's painful. It costs you something. When we realize that God is worth it, it doesn't make the pain go away. It's still painful. It still costs you whatever it is, your time or your resources. But it's worth it because you come to value the Lord for who he is. And the more you stare in the face of God, the more you meditate on who he is, the more you come to know him through his word, you find that there is no amount that is too much to sacrifice for the Lord. Paul says here in Philippians, I'm going to end with this. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Do we also have that view and that picture of who God is so much that everything that we would give for him doesn't matter. It's worth it. Because God is worth it. Let's bow our heads this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we simply pray that you would open up our eyes, that we might see who you are more and more, that as we meditate on you and on your glory and on your great name and your great fame, would you help us to give you that which you deserve according to 
according to your position in the world as our creator God. Help us to do so with joy and with thanksgiving. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all rise and sing these songs together in response to the message. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me no fate i dread i know i am Sure, sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and He was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus, now and ever. chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me
that this morning. We pray that you would help us to make the proper sacrifice of praise that your name deserves. And now to you, O Lord, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to you, and you alone be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Let me take a moment right now to welcome you again to our worship service. If you came in late, thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, just a couple of announcements before we dismiss. In a moment, we're going to dismiss. Come out the front here. We invite you to join us for refreshments in the B building. A um, couple of announcements. These have been communicated on the email. But I want to remind you again that on February the 5th, it's the first Sunday of February at 11.15, uh, at we have a membership meeting. This is our typical beginning of the year membership meeting. It's going to involve reporting from last year, a financial report, an update on the pastoral searches again. Um, <clears throat> so we hope that you can make it on February the 5th. Uh, we're going to split the membership meeting into two components. The English version of the membership meeting is going to be at 11.15 in the B building, and the Chinese one is going to be after the Chinese worship service. You are invited to attend either. Um, if you can't make it, there are absentee forms in the back. There's also going to be an ele electronic absentee form. I'll send it out this coming week. Um, I don't know if you noticed. Hey, Lauren, can you put it up? Put up the slideshow, the announcement slideshow. There you go. Okay. So behind me, you see this wonderful slideshow. Now. The uh, lady who does this slideshow, she's back there. 
She's just trying to be all shy about it, okay? It's Christina Poon, and she is about two weeks from giving birth to their first child. She needs a break, okay? She, uh, we, need a, we need to find a replacement for a little while, for a couple of months. And uh, the program that we use for this is called Canva. It, uh, is it easy? Yeah, she's just being humble. It's really hard, and she's very skilled. Uh, no, it's actually, it's, it's quite intuitive. If you feel so inclined, you're comfortable with this kind of stuff, and you have an ability to, to replace her for the next couple of months, please come talk to one of a few people. You can talk to Nate, you can talk to Silas, you can talk to me, okay? And come and let us know that you'd like to do that, and uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you set up. As I said earlier, uh, the donation receipts for 2022 are now available. It was going to depend on the weather. Obviously, it's raining outside. I think it's still raining outside. Um, it's not rain. It's sunny outside. Also, it might just be outside the sanctuary front door on a table. Go ahead and pick it up. And if it's, if it's not, then it's going to be near the B building, okay, one or the other place. Uh, and lastly, uh, or actually two more things. One is the, the Oasis Winter Retreat is coming up. Highlight of the Oasis calendar year. It's the third weekend of February during the President's Day holiday weekend. Sign-ups are right now. Please come and or, or, or sign up as quickly as you can. Uh, the deadline is in February. And then lastly, I want to thank everyone for participating in the Missions Pledge. Actually, Lauren, can, you can take it off. This is actually more challenging. It's hard to take it off. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, the missions pledge period is now closed. The goal was 17000 per month. This is to support all the missionaries and missions agencies that our church supports on our list. And the final pledged amount was 16234 for just shy of $17,000. Um, but the missions committee is meeting to discuss how to make up that shortfall, whether it's through the reserve. Uh, it by all accounts, should be, uh, should be achievable. So thank you for participating in that. And with that now, we are now dismissed. Thank you for joining us this morning. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you in the next building for refreshments. <laughs>